All right, good morning. So Danny and Twyla are obviously not here. They are enjoying some family time. They are away uh, from town this weekend, and that leaves you with me. I will apologize in advance. Sorry for that. And obviously the praise team is Memorex this morning, not live. Ha, see, anyone under 30 not get that reference? Yeah, see, that's kind of what I thought. So what I thought we would do this morning is sort of an introduction to a series in the Bible class hour that we're going to start up in, what is it, three weeks from now? It's the 16th. Um, a series that I've put together called God's Law, and it's going to be seven to eight weeks. I haven't really decided on that last lesson yet, but what it's going to be is uh, we're going to take a look at God's Law and what it meant to uh, those who those who initially received it, uh, what it meant to those who continued to live in Israel and Judea and continue to get truth from it, and what it means to us, Gentile Christians, living in the 21st century. It's been a good six-month Bible study. I'm excited to bring that to 9 o'clock Bible class, and so I hope it's going to be interesting for y'all as well. So that's first thing, shameless plug for adult Bible class. What I wanted to mainly focus on this morning is, as a sort of introduction to that series, is we're going to open up Psalm 119. It is a beautifully written psalm. It's the longest psalm in the Bible, and the entire psalm is an appreciation poem, just an outpouring of love for and devotion to the law of God. You know, so much modern day thinking is the law is oppressive or it's constricting. I don't like that. But the Jewish relationship with the law was, it was a positive thing. It was a joyous thing. And I think one of the clearest examples of that was Ezra's reading of the entire law and the celebratory environment that that was. If y'all remember, here was the scene. It was decades after the exiles got to return to Jerusalem from Babylon, and they had a ton of work to do to rebuild Jerusalem, which they found in rubble. And in the midst of adversaries, stopping the work and other kings ordering the work to get stopped and then start up again. And they finally got to rebuild Jerusalem and they got the temple rebuilt and the walls rebuilt. And then the people asked Ezra to bring out the law of Moses. They desired to hear what God had to say. They were hungry for the bread that feeds the soul. And they built a pulpit for him to stand at. And Ezra stood up there. It was on the first day of the month when three significant things happened for the nation of Israel. That month contained the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So it was a major time of the year. Ezra began by blessing the Lord. And all the people gathered there shouted a huge amen. And they lowered their faces to the ground, ready to receive the word of God in a humble worship stance. Ezra opened the word and began to read it, and everyone stood, which is a wonderful tradition that I'm so glad that we do here in this church as well, showing respect for the word of God. Yeah, And what they did was, Ezra would read a section of God's word and then would pause, and there were teachers there, ministers, who would expound on what had just been read. It was a time of deeper teaching, and then they'd move on to the next section. And it went on like that all day, and it says nobody got tired. They relished this deep intake of God's word as long as it took. The people first reacted by crying, because they realized upon hearing it how far off they were, decades and decades of not hearing it, not obeying it, realized how far off the mark they were, 
And the teachers said, don't mourn about this. Here we are on this day, this great day, hearing the word of God finally after so many years. This is a good thing. And the weeping turned into joyous celebration because they had heard and understood God's voice through his word. And so that spilled over to the next days. During the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, Ezra read the scriptures during all those days, and all this resulted in total enthusiastic obedience to God's word. Now, the psalm that we're going to open up this morning, Psalm 119, was written, okay, I'm going to give some technical aspects about it. Um, it's very much the same sentiments as what the feeling of that, that scene was. Verse 105 is probably the most widely known in the psalm, and it encapsulates the feeling of the whole thing. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119 is just this huge outpouring of the psalmist's love for and devotion to God's law, which he also calls God's word. So some technical aspects of the psalm. It is an acrostic, um, and it is a huge acrostic. There are 22 sections. Each of those corresponds to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So Aleph is the first section, Beth is the second section, Gimel the third, and so on. Each of these sections has eight lines. And so someone, quick do the math, 22 sections, each with eight lines, means that the whole psalm is 176 verses. Very good. Each line in each section in the Hebrew begins with that letter. So all eight lines in the Aleph section begin with the Ah sound. And then all eight lines in the Beth section begin with the Bah sound. You get the idea. It's kind of a, maybe the first Dr. Seuss book, right? No one has really locked down who the author is. Everything I looked up had it all over the place. Said it could have been David, could have been Daniel, could have been Ezra. All right, there's like 500 years difference between these guys. So obviously no, no one knows the date when it was written either. One thing I saw suggested that there was this orthodox tradition that said that David used to use this psalm to teach his little son Solomon, Solomon the alphabet. Don't leave this room thinking that. You know how silly those extra biblical stories can be, all right? None of that's important. I don't want to park there. What's important is this is a love letter, an appreciation letter for the scriptures. And I think a takeaway for us is going to be, may God give us a love for the scriptures like that of the author of this psalm. Yeah? The person who wrote this did not consider the law to be a burden. They did not see God's law as a huge list of don'ts, because he knows that God's law is a light to your path. You want to know how to walk in step with God? You want to know what behaviors God likes? Read the scriptures. You will be blessed. Verse 1 starts off with this, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. There's your theme for the whole psalm right there. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. All right, you know this word walk, what does this mean? He's listed it a couple of times now in the first three verses. It means how you conduct your life, how you live your life. Your way of life must be in step with God because his ways are perfect. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, the psalmist says in verse 5. Following God's law keeps you upright, the illumination of God to us. That's what this is. Now, the psalmist asks a key question. First line of the Beth section, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? 
by guarding it according to your word. Talks about staying in step. I want to not wander away from your commandments. How do you do that? I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's a powerful example of why we need to have the word of God stored up in our hearts. And it's not just memorizing words, it's loving those words, making them a part of our whole appreciation. Matthew chapter 4, right after the moment that Jesus was baptized and began his ministry, he was led into the wilderness. Purpose of that was he was to be tempted by the devil, right? And so Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Bible then says very simply, he was hungry. I mean, yeah, I would imagine that would be the case, right? What was the first thing the tempter tried? Food, right? Came up to him and he said, so um, you're the supposed son of God, are you? Huh. Yeah, how does the Son of God end up being here all weak and hungry like this? Doesn't God create stuff? Why don't you, I don't know, these, these stones here, why don't you turn them into bread and eat, man? I mean, Mr. Son of God. Jesus answered with Scripture. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, what was he quoting? Quick, JJ. <laughs> it's Deuteronomy. That's why I pointed at you. Deuteronomy 8, that was Moses talking to the people of Israel when they were at the end of their 40-year journey. And that was about manna. Okay, the miracle of manna was God providing exactly the right amount of food every day. The exercise was having a complete dependence on God. And the instruction to the people was you go out in the morning, you collect just enough for today, and you don't dare try to keep any surplus for tomorrow. Why not? What happened if you tried that? Manna you tried to keep overnight got disgusting. There'd be worms in it. It stunk up to high heaven. That's actually from the Bible. It doesn't say it like that, but it taught the people the concept of give us this day our daily bread, you know? The point was know and trust God. Food will be there. And yeah, food is necessary for your body, but that's not what it's all about. You got to be thinking about the word of God in the same way as food for your spiritual well-being. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If I have God's word anchored in me, then I'll be able to resist the fake news of the devil. The rest of those, te those temptations were similar. Satan then tried to use scriptures to make Jesus do things that he shouldn't. Satan's like, aha, this guy knows scripture. I can do that. I can play that game. And so... He says, and let me tell you, this is important. Nobody knows God's word better than Satan. You think you got the Bible memorized. You don't know it inside and out as well as Satan does. And he uses that knowledge to twist it around. And we saw it there in Matthew 4. Satan twisted a couple of scriptures around to make it sound like something it wasn't. Thing is, you can't twist God's word against God in the flesh. Know what I mean? So the devil's like, throw yourself down. The Bible says God will command his angels to save you. Jesus is like, dude, are you seriously trying to have a Bible quote battle with me right now? Because check this one out. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now go away, son. You bother me we got to spend time in the Word. And by the way, that's more than doing a Bible reading plan, in my opinion. I read four chapters today. Ha ha! How about that? Great for me. But what did I consume 
in the reading? What did God speak to me with my mind open to his messaging? Let me ask you this. How many times do people approach the word of God like it's a research project? Trying to find something that you know has to be somewhere. You just got to find where it is because you have this idea in your head, this belief. And I can't remember where it came from. Maybe from children's Bible class, maybe from a sermon, maybe from a quote on the internet, right? Those are safe. I got this thing on my mind and I got to go find where it is in the Bible. That is not a direct me stance, right? That is not a God, I'm open to your direction today. That is, uh, I've got my own ideas about what I want to learn right now, and I'm going to seek that out for myself. Let's scroll all the way. I say scroll like you're on a tablet. If you're on a Bible, that's <clears throat> all the way to the end of the Psalm 169, verse 169, where the psalmist is saying this very same thing. He says, let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth, pour, pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. You teach me. I have to have an appreciation of the scriptures. And the fact that the Lord is there and walks me through them, he teaches me. I don't teach myself. Yeah? All right, scroll. Scroll back up to verse 14 of Psalm 119. Here's some ways that this psalmist describes the word of God or the law of God. He says, I delight in your testimonies as much as I would in riches. I will delight in your statutes. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Wow, let me ask you this. How often do we long for God's rules? He says in verse 24, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Now you're getting an idea of what God's law, God's word means to the individual who wants to grow a rich and thorough relationship with the Father. We see that the psalmist has this love for the word, for God's laws. Now, in our time frame, as Gentile, non-Jewish Christians today, under the second covenant, we don't have the same relationship with God's law that the first covenant people did. We live under God's grace and faith in our Lord. For the psalmist, the law was the single lifeline to God. We're going to explore that thought more in the Bible class series, but a couple of things I want to point out. First of all, Christ fulfilled the law, but that didn't make it go away. It didn't erase it. God's law is God. It is there forever. And for us, the purpose now is to make sure that we see who God is and what his standards are so that we can live our best life. Thank you, Karen. That was a wonderful, wonderful phrase I'm going to steal and I'm going to reuse. We can live our best life trying to walk in step with him. Do we fail? Of course we do. We're human beings, but we know where we failed because the law shows us. And that gives us an idea of where we need to strive to do better. And by doing that, we get closer to God. For a Christian living in Christ, conforming to God's law is a pleasure. It's something that we want to do that we are happy to do because it brings us closer to our loving Father and ultimately closer to the blessings that we receive from Him. God's law is a gift, as Karen said earlier as well. And it is directly for those who follow Him. It is not for all people. It is not for those who choose not to follow God. It teaches us how to live as God intends us to. 
His law is for our benefit, to guide us, to help us keep in alignment with his will. Yeah? Verse 44 says this, I will keep your law continually forever and ever. I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. Okay, you heard that in the reading. Did that phrase, I will walk in a wide place, trip you up maybe? Yeah, I had to stop and think about that too. What does that mean? Okay, this is actually pretty simple. This is where the ESV is probably being a little more literal in its translation. There's another translation that says, I shall walk in an open expanse. Another that says, I will walk around freely. I think the NIV is the one that makes this a little easier for us today. It says, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. That's a Hebrew phrase this walk about in a wide place where where he says he has plenty of space to walk around because the place is wide it's a metaphor to say he has freedom he is freer because of following god's laws we should not think of obeying god's laws as something that inhibits or restrains us instead it frees us to be who god designed us to be all right what are some of the things that we know because of what God's law has told us. In our daily walk with our Lord, in, in, in Christ Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, the law, the scripture, hands us the blueprint. We know how to live because it's told us. Here's some examples. We know to put nothing before the Lord our God, that he alone is God, and we must love him with all our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. What else? We know better than to try to fit God into a shape or an idol that anything we try to have represent God is super limiting. And in fact, we are at that point worshiping something that is not God. It's less than God. That's an idol. We know better than to misuse god's name you're going to say god's name and talk about him you better be sure god's name is special it is his personal identity i am who i am he said we must never use his name frivolously what's that mean mentioning god's name should be in praise or worship in awe obviously never in curse or jest yeah you know how jewish people don't spell out the word god they put that dash in the middle that's out of respect for the name you also have another rule i looked up and found out just this week never utter god's name in a place of filth like a bathroom okay respect for god's name should be important to us Watch how you say his name. What else do we know? We know there's a Sabbath, a day of rest, a gift from God. We need to take that rest and appreciate God for it. We know to honor your parents. We know not to murder anyone, to not commit adultery, to not steal, to not lie on the witness stand. And we know not to wish that we had our neighbor's junk. We know not to take advantage of people, to not mistreat people. If you see someone's lost property, take it back to them. All those last ones roll up to one simple phrase that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, right? When we know and live by what God has described for us, we have the freedom to fulfill his plan for our lives. We're not constantly wringing our hands, worried about what God thinks of us because we don't know if we're on the right track or not. We have a blueprint right there. We know if we're on the right track or not. All right, now you have the blueprint. Now you know. What if we're not on the right track? Scrolling a little further down in the psalm, I want you to look at verse 65. He says this, you have dealt well with your servant. Just think about those words for a minute. Dealt well. O Lord, according to your word, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. 
Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. What did he just say? God dealt with him. And before he was afflicted by God, he went astray. The psalmist understands that there's times when we're in the wrong. And God needs to course correct us. And there's two ways that God does this. If you want to turn with me, I'm going to take a look at a passage in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Starting in verse 5, the author of Hebrews begins with a quote from Proverbs 3. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Okay, you just heard me say there's two ways that God helps to make sure that we're on the right path. This first word, discipline, here is the first one. It's punishment. Whenever we keep doing what we know is wrong, God's going to bring the hammer down. He is correcting you. Don't take that lightly. Don't ignore it. The next word in our Hebrews passage is different. He says, also, do not be weary when reproved by him. Reproved, that is correction. It is rebuke. It is instruction. It is a reprimand. So God tells us when we're wrong, and he punishes when the time is fitting to do so. Do not play down when God does this. Why not? Verse 6 in our Hebrews passage, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Right? If there's no discipline, there's no training and correction, is that not neglect? What is the opposite of love, by the way? I'll give you a hint. It's not hate. The opposite of love is apathy, neglect. If a father ignores his child, that is evidence of a lack of care. So if there's no training, there's no discipline, there's no nothing, that means there's nothing there. There's no relationship there. It's encouraging because he's saying, you don't want neglect. Neglect would mean you're probably not part of the family. Verse 8 in Hebrews, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. When you have strayed from the path of following God, knowingly strayed, and start living your life that way, and he disciplines you, that's a gift. Because he's helping you return to the right direction again. So you won't remain hopelessly lost. It means he cares about you, and he's not going to let you fall away. All right. Let's talk about waiting for God. This is where, this is the part of the sermon where I should have just recorded it first and sat down because this is to me. Because it's about patience, which I don't have. Verse 81 of Psalm 119 says this, My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. All right, we all know what that word hope means. We've, we've said it several times in this building. I am certain, I am sure that your promise is coming. I have no doubt. I completely, 100% know and trust in God's promise. And I'm just waiting. Right? That's what hope is. Just a waiting thing. He says, verse 82, My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Okay. I had to stop with that one too. <clears throat> Y'all know what that means? Wineskin in the smoke? Anyone? Okay. It's pretty easy, actually, once you do the little bit of research. That phrase just means he feels useless. If you exposed a wineskin to smoke, it dried it up, it shriveled it down. You can't use that for anything anymore, so it's just trash. He says he feels like that thing, which just got tossed in the garbage. Yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? How long? That's not anything you've ever asked God, right? 
You're not alone in this. Job asked this question to God several times in his story. Habakkuk, that was his main question to God in his book. How long are these Babylonians going to keep us, our people as captives? There's a lot of Psalms that ask this question, how long, O Lord, do I have to wait? You think the Lord is slow to respond? Or is his timing perfect? Sure feels like a long time to us. And I wonder if that's even getting more unbearable in today's modern short attention span society that's made that way mostly because of technology. It's funny, right? Someone will say, oh, this website, website's taking forever to load, and it's like five seconds, right? Like you should have seen dial-up back in the 90s. You got nothing to complain about, kid. 2 Peter 3.8 says this, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years can be like one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. What does that mean? It means our, our concept of time urgency is not the same as God's. How long were the Israelites slaves in Egypt? 430 years. How many generations is that? The promise was made to one guy and his immediate family, and yet they all ended up passing away, never got to see the promised land themselves. And then there was generations and generations and generations. Imagine you're living in year 250 of that 430 years. You never saw or knew those people who had directly received the promise from God, and you're never going to see the promised land at the end. You're going your entire life as a slave in Egypt. All right, here's another perspective on 430 years. 430 years ago was the year 1593. Like, we can't even wrap our heads around how different the world is from then to now, yeah? God's timing can seem so long to us. And it can even make the most faithful people in, in, in Bible history second-guess things. I'm thinking Abraham and Sarah right? Okay. Abraham was 75 when God approached him and promised that his offspring would grow into a massive country. About six years later, no babies yet. Abraham and Sarah getting pretty old. So Abraham says to God, okay, God, tell me if I'm off base here. But you promised me that my heirs would grow into a massive nation, I doubt I'm going to have any kids. So is it probably my servant, Eliezer? He's going to be the heir that inherits everything? God says, no, Abraham, not your servant. It will be your own child. Okay. Four years after that, it's now been 10 years since the original promise. Abraham's 85 years old. Sarah's 75 still no kids. You're like, is there a fertility clinic or something that we can go to? So again, they start second guessing. Here's an idea. Maybe God meant this. And Sarah comes up with this whole idea. Abraham, how about you father your child with my servant, Hagar? There you go. Now you got a kid. So they do that. 13 years later after that, Abraham's 99 years old. He's got a 13-year-old son named Ishmael, whose mother was the handservant. And God approaches Abraham and says, Hey, Abraham, just FYI, it's almost time for your promised kid, who's going to be the root of the huge nation. just want to give you the heads up. Y'all remember what Abraham's reaction was to that particular exchange? He went into hysterics. He laughed hysterically. He's like, what? I'm 99. Sarah's 90. She's reached menopause, for crying out loud. You got to be talking about Ishmael, right? No, Abraham. Sarah is going to bear your child. 
And by the way, I've already come up with his name. It's Isaac. You're welcome now that you don't have to go buy a baby names book. Right? What's the point? The best of our biblical heroes who had so much more faith and patience than I ever hoped to reach, reached their tipping point. God will wait us out. I reach my tipping point a lot faster than Abraham and Sarah did. There's no comparison with me. God's like, you kidding me? A day, that's how long you lasted before throwing your tantrum? Here's what I want us to consider as we wrap up. There's two ways that you can look at life and basically the word of God as well. From a positive perspective, or from a negative perspective. Positively, we could say the ultimate goal in life is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Negatively, we could approach the word by saying the ultimate goal in life is to do a bunch of don'ts and avoid sin. How many times have you heard someone say, Christianity, just a bunch of don'ts, thou shalt not. Psalm 119 verse 11, I think gives us one of the keys to avoid sin. Let's go way back to the start of, of the sermon, really, and read it again. Verse 11, it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Real quick, other translations, I have hidden your word in my heart. That's the NIV. The New American Standard translates it as your word I have treasured in my heart. I like that word. Because it's not just about memorization. Learned a bunch of scriptures and so I'm all armed up. I really like this word treasured because I believe it is the heart of what this is saying. He didn't say, I've stored up your word in my mind, got them all memorized. He said, in my heart, God's word is valuable. It's considered as a treasure. I believe what keeps us on track is the combination of two things. It's not just knowing the Word of God in your mind, and it's not just treasuring the Word of God, it's both. We value the Word of God, and therefore we have it stored in our hearts. It is in the treasuring of God's Word that we stand. God's word is true. It will never fail. And in the song that we're about to sing, pay attention to the words. The words say, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I will prevail. Let's stand together and sing this song of encouragement together.